<clears throat> I'm President Ulysses S. Grant, and I thank you for joining me this day here in the library, where I will reflect about my parents, Jesse Root Grant and Hannah Simpson Grant. There's much that I can say about my father. Very little there is to say about my mother. Uh, that parallels their lives because it seems that my father, Jesse Grant, never stopped talking and my mother, Hannah Grant, never started talking. But uh, I'd like to think out loud with you about both of them. My father was born in Greenburg, Pennsylvania in 1794, January 23rd of 1794, and he died in Covington, Kentucky, on June 29th, 1873. Father was 79 years old. My mother was born on a farm near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, to John Simpson, and uh, they moved to Georgetown when my mother was 19 years old and settled there to begin farming. My mother was born on November 23rd of 1798, and she died on May the 11th of 1883. Mother was 84 years old at the time of her death. They were married on June the 24th of 1821. Uh, but to think back about my father, <clears throat> father was one of seven children of Noah Grant, uh, called himself Captain Noah Grant, and said he fought from Bunker Hill to the surrender at uh, Yorktown by Cornwallis, but uh, no one has ever been able to find any record of his military service. So it's darkly rumored that grandfather never really did serve. He was a cobbler by trade. He had married, had two children, and uh, his wife died. He moved to Ohio, near Deerfield, Ohio, northern Ohio, and uh, married Rachel Kelly, and they had five more children. And uh, my grandmother died in 1805, and my grandfather apparently went into a life of dissipation. My father said, from time to time that grandfather uh, had great wealth and worked diligently to squander it. He uh, drank himself to death uh, uh, pretty much. He died in 1819 in Maysville, Kentucky with my uncle Peter over there in Maysville. But father, when his mother died, uh, was 11 years old and was uh, put out on his own. Uh, his, his father, my grandfather, apprenticed him out to farmers to work, several farmers, and uh, scattered the children all over with relatives and friends. He just was not able to face raising a family. Uh, and father, <clears throat> though, was apprenticed to uh, Ohio Supreme Court Justice George Todd, and was he and his older sister, oldest sister, Susan, lived with the Todds for nearly four years. And that's where father first began to be educated and develop his taste for the finer things in life. He was determined that he might have been born poor, but he was not going to stay poor. And Mrs. Todd took a great interest in him. In fact, she paid for the five or six months of formal schooling, all that he ever had. He went to school for about three years at uh, three months, four months at a time. He learned how to read, how to write, uh, became a very uh, good reader, a voracious reader, a talent which and a, a bent I inherited from father. And she encouraged him, Mrs. Todd did, to uh, get, learn a trade. And something else of note, they had a son, the Todds had a son, David, who became the governor of Ohio during the War of the Rebellion. Uh, but father went to learn uh, the trade. He uh, joined his brother Peter in Maysville, Kentucky, and apprenticed himself to him. Uh, two or three years later, he was done with his obligation. He went back to Northern Ohio, 
uh, got into a partnership in a tannery, ultimately bought the tannery, saved about $1,500, and promptly caught malaria, became very seriously ill, was engaged to be married, and uh, he lost all of his health, all of his money, and his fiance. He went back to Maysville and uh, became uh, healed up and, and convalesced. And he went back to Ohio and apprenticed himself to a farmer and a tanner, Owen Brown. Now, Mr. Brown, it was noteworthy he was, of two things. He was a staunch anti-abolitionist, and he also had a son named John. Uh, and father was with them for two or three years. And yes, it's that John Brown of Harper's Ferry fame. Father described him as very intelligent, bright, nice fellow, uh, but uh, anarchic in his feelings. He, he was uh, vehement in his feelings, whatever it was, and he was vehemently opposed to slavery. But father went back to Point Pleasant, Ohio, on the banks of the Ohio River, just across the river from Maysville. He was familiar with that area, obviously, and uh, went into partnership and ultimately bought a tannery. Uh, at age 25 or 6, he decided it's time for him to get a wife. He went to Corton. He didn't go far. Uh, Georgetown's only 10 miles away, and he met Hannah uh, Simpson, courted her, and they married on June the 24th of 1821. She was about 21 years old, a little over five feet tall. Uh, father described her as handsome without any vanity. Uh, she was very quiet and remained so the rest of her life. In 10 months, they uh, uh, had me. I arrived on April 27th of 1822. Uh, ten months after their marriage. Now there may have been people the, uh, counting the days before my birth, but in all truth, anyone who ever spent a minute or more with my mother would know that any premarital dalliance on the part of my mother would was unthinkable. It uh, just it wouldn't happen. Then father uh, moved to Georgetown in. August of 1823, he built a brick house, which was a sign for father to indicate his wealth, and began a tannery, and he also had a farm, about 30 acres of farm, and he tended about 50 acres of oak trees, uh, and began his uh, ultimately very successful tanning business, freight business, uh, farming. He, he was an entrepreneur, a builder, a contractor and uh, gained in his success. But now, a description of my father is appropriate at this time. Jesse Root Grant was about six feet tall, perhaps a little taller, broad-shouldered, big, very physically uh, dominant man. He was very sharp and quick-witted. He was self-educated. He had 30 volumes in his personal library. In our home, we had the largest library in Brown County. Georgetown, Ohio. Father was self-taught. In fact, after he and mother married, he taught himself grammar. And this was after he was married with a baby on the way. He was hungry to learn. But commensurate with his hunger to learn uh, was his abrasive, sometimes abusive to others, personality. Father was uh, a shrewd businessman knew how to make a dollar. In fact, one of his friends described him, and I think perhaps not in a friendly manner, described him as he would chase a dollar to hell and uh, very close with his money. But equal to that, he had a passion for politics. He organized debate clubs. He, uh, well, he ran for the mayor of Georgetown and lost in 1830. He ran for the state house in 1832 and lost. He later became elected the mayor of Georgetown. In fact, he was mayor of Georgetown, Ohio, when I left for the academy. Uh, then he moved to, when I was in the academy, to Covington, uh, to Bethel, Ohio, a few miles away, and was mayor there uh, after about 10 years. He started another tannery, became mayor in Bethel, Ohio. So father was actively involved in politics. He was a uh, Jackson Democrat, very proud of it. Mother was a Democrat as well. 
uh, father wrote for the local paper uh, and the castigator, which was in Ripley, just a few miles away, immediately next to Georgetown, I mean Mount Pleasant or Point Pleasant on the Ohio River. So you had Point Pleasant where I was born next to it, Ripley, Ohio, which is in fable and fame as where Eliza crossed the Ohio River in Uncle Tom's cabin and went to the Rankin's cabin, which is thinly dis veiled and disguised in that book. But The Castigator uh, was a paper that Father wrote for, advertised in. He wrote a lot of poetry, some pretty corny poetry, actually. I, I never cared for it. I have a sample. Father wrote this after the war when he had established I had long established the uh, Perkins and Grant, or Grant and Perkins business in Galena. And this is one of Father's products. Since Grant has whipped the Rebel Lee and open trade from sea to sea, our goods and price soon advance, then don't neglect the present chance to call on Grant and Perkins. So Father, that that's a a very good example of father's skill in, in writing poetry. But he also wrote uh, vehement, vituperative, uh, polemical articles about politics, being a Jackson Democrat, which led to a problem for him because he ultimately went over to, in 1832, to being a Whig uh, candidate. And this put him at cross purposes with the men who were still holding on to the Jacksonian Democrat uh, school of thought because the Whigs were becoming anti-slavery and, and the Democrats were not, at least half the country they were not, and a father couldn't abide that. But he took to uh, task one Thomas Hamer, who lived in Georgetown. He too had immigrated from Pennsylvania, came there as a school teacher, read law, became an attorney, became the county court clerk, ultimately elected to the Ohio State House, became Speaker of the Ohio State House, elected to the United States Congress. But he and Father had a disagreement over Jackson's vetoing the charter for the National Bank. And at first Father opposed it, then he supported it. But uh, when he opposed it, uh, he and, and Hamer, Tom Hamer, who supported it, fell out. And uh, Father wrote some pretty dastardly articles about him and the castigator, and they didn't speak. Well, later, when it came time to seek an appointment for me to the academy, my father wound up having to ask Tom Hamer, who very graciously uh, agreed and appointed me to the academy. Uh, because of that tiff, where well, they hadn't spoken for a number of years, uh, it resulted in my army issue name, as I like to call it, Ulysses S. Grant, because Hamer thought my middle name was Simpson, as was custom, my mother's maiden name. It was not. I was born and christened Hiram Ulysses Grant. He thought it was Ulysses S. Grant and wrote that on the appointment papers. And I was unsuccessful in getting that changed. And I became Ulysses S. Grant. So father uh, was abrasive, uh, and people, some people disliked him, but most people didn't dislike him. They, they tolerated him. He was a good man, and they knew it. He was just a little tough to get along with it at times. And uh, he, when it came time for me to work in the tannery, I loathed it. He knew it. But he let me drive the wagons to make pickups and deliveries to do the plowing on the farm and to, to break train uh, horses for him and for other farmers in the area. Uh, and I was quite content with that. In fact, father began when I was about 10, 11 years old. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, he sent me as far away as Louisville, Kentucky, frequently, Cincinnati more frequently, and at one time I took two lawyers to Toledo, Ohio, which was about a two-week trip. Uh, I was glad to be able to go, and nobody was sad. It was a joke to see two lawyers leaving Georgetown. But uh, Father didn't think I was going to be any good at anything but the military, and at least I went to the military 
I'd have a, a, a life being an engineer. And he got me the appointment and uh, without my knowledge. And, but I, I told him, if you think I'll go, then I think I'll go. And I went to the academy and entered the army. Later in life, after I resigned from the army, I appealed to him several times to give me some loans so I could farm in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, and he, he denied that. Uh, and we did not have the best of relationship. Now, he and my mother did not come to my wedding when I married Julia Dent on August the 22nd of 1848 in St. Louis because the Dents were slaveholding fa uh, slave family and mother and father would not attend that wedding. Uh, father came to my inaugurations when I was president, but he didn't stay uh, in the White House. He stayed at Willard's Hotel because by this time, Julia's father, Colonel Dent, Frederick Dent, is living in the White House with us, and they they were there at the same time, but they couldn't abide each other, and it was very difficult for each of them to be together. So Father would frequently visit, but he wouldn't stay in the White House. Mother never came to Washington City, never. She uh, felt it inappropriate. She didn't want to draw attention to herself. Father came frequently. And as life went on, the war came about, and Father, well, when I resigned from the Army in 54 and Father found out about it, he got a congressman to try to uh, uh, implore Secretary of War Jefferson Davis to deny my resignation and put me in a recruiting post. Uh, he also wrote a letter to Secretary of War Davis imploring him not to accept my resignation and the response he got was the resignation has been accepted the matter is ended so father always meddled in my career and during the the war of the rebellion he uh, wrote a number of articles defending me particularly after shiloh when i was being uh, excoriated for alleged failures and mistakes and so forth Father wrote several Cincinnati area newspapers vehemently defending me, and it seemed as if they were coming from me. And I finally wrote him a letter and said, stop writing these editorials and letters to the newspapers. You are doing me more harm than my worst enemy could do me. Leave the matter alone. Do not write things about me and put them in the newspaper." So he finally grudgingly did pretty much. He still would write some things. He, uh, after he reached retirement, well, President Johnson appointed him postmaster at Covington, Kentucky, and I renewed that appointment when I became president. Father was wanting to retire at about that time, and he had amassed a worth of about $100,000. And he, he it included uh, me in, the, uh, in his will. My brother Simpson had died by then, died in 61, and my sister Clara had died uh, uh, in 65. So the four children still left. He was going to leave us all an equal portion. And I, I requested that he not because I made it clear I hadn't had anything to do with his amassing of that fortune, give it to my other siblings. Father uh, agreed with this and did leave each of my four children a thousand dollars apiece for their education. And father died on, uh, as I said earlier, June the 29th of 73, he collapsed in the post office uh, was, in, as I understand, insensible for about an hour. Then he came to and died very shortly thereafter at age 79. And he's buried in Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati, Ohio. I didn't have the best of relationship with my father. Uh, I was not, I was a personality like my mother. And that meant totally opposite of my father. He thought I, I didn't have enough drive to succeed. 
I wasn't like him in any way, and I think that perplexed him more than frustrated him. Uh, I don't think he was ever, well, that when I had resigned from the Army, he, he made it clear he was disappointed in me, but when I got back in the Army at the beginning of the War of the Rebellion, his estimation went back up, although he did criticize me for taking the colonelcy of the 21st Illinois. He said I should have taken a regular Army colonel's appointment. Of course, at that time, I was desperately trying to get a regular Army colonel's appointment, and I was getting nowhere. So I was happy to take the 21st Illinois volunteer assignment. Uh, when I became a general, Brigadier General, Father said, well, uh, you've made general, don't mess it up. Hold on to it. It's a good job. So Father always had, he would always pat me on the back and slap me across the face. It, it was that kind of a relationship with Father. His opinion mattered a great deal to me. And, and I love my father, but it was a, a difficult situation at times. I shall miss him. My mother is another matter. Now, Hannah Simpson was quiet and a devoted Christian, Bible-believing, fundamental Methodist Episcopal woman. And she believed in uh, her church, the Bible, and in third place, her family. She did not seek, nor could she abide, any compliment or any favoritism expressed in her direction. In fact, when she heard people praising me, she would leave the room, if not the house, because she felt that was indirectly praising her and that uh, that was prideful. And being prideful was, if not a sin, very close to it. So mother was very, she wasn't stern, she was reserved. She didn't talk. She never talked much at all. I never heard her laugh. Never heard my mother laugh. I didn't often hear mother speak. Uh, she was an intelligent woman, uh, a good-hearted woman. I have a description that I wrote of her that I, I will share with you. When I was a child, uh, someone told her that I was swinging on the tails of horses in the barnyard, uh, tannery yard and I was going to get kicked and killed, and my mother said, no, I don't think he will. Horses seem to understand this, and he understands horses. So mother was of that calm demeanor. Uh, some people would say repressed, but mother was very calm and quiet. She, uh, with my father, helped establish the Georgetown Methodist Church and uh, right across the road from our home there in Georgetown, and Father became a, a deacon and a leader in the church. It's always the secretary of any committee or any activity. But Mother uh, had us all Christian in the church and required that all of us go to church except me. My parents never required that I go to church. Um, when I left to go to the academy, I bid farewell to my parents, and I walked right behind our home to the Bailey House, just 100, 200 feet behind where we lived, and uh, said goodbye to Mrs. Bailey. She hugged me and sobbed, and I, I stepped back. I was taken aback a, a bit, and I said, I, I didn't get this at home from my mother. Uh, so emotions were not shown in our family. Uh, our dinners were quiet. Uh, no one spoke unless Father spoke. If he had something to say, he said it. And that's, that's how I was reared. I, I'm very much like my mother, I think. I don't say much. I was felt to be slow as a child because I didn't say much. And Mother instilled that in us, and, and not to seek attention, which I have never sought attention. But my mother only did that we know of one newspaper interview, just one. She denied all the others. And somehow a reporter for the graphic spoke to her in New Jersey. Uh, after I had left the presidency, I was coming back from my round the world tour. 
And the reporter asked mother about rearing me and the rest of the family, my five brothers and sisters. And mother said, this was in the newspaper, the graphic. Uh, what did, what did, did she think of me? And uh, she said, well, very fair, though I don't know as he was any different from the rest of them. But people seem to think I'll say so now. He was always a steady, serious sort of boy who took everything in earnest, even when he played, he made a business of it. So that was, I, I never thought of myself in that manner, but that's how mother described me uh, in the late 1870s, early 1880s. After we married, of course, the slaveholding family uh, to marry into the abolitionist family and they didn't come to my wedding we did go after a short period of time to visit them so julia could meet them and julia wrote this description of my mother she was a handsome woman a little below medium height with soft brown eyes glossy brown hair and her cheek was like a rose in the snow she was the most self-sacrificing the sweetest, kindest woman I ever met, except my own dear mother. So even though there was friction between Julia and my parents that eased up a bit most of the time, she wrote and thought very kindly of my mother. Uh, so mother never had much to say to anyone about anything, but she was very stern about not seeking praise. In fact, the first time I went home to visit with them in Covington, Kentucky, after Lee had surrendered to me, I knocked on the door and mother had been sewing, apparently. And when she opened the door, she looked me up and down and she said, after a pause, well, Liz, I expect you are a famous man now come in. Went back, sat down, and went back to her sewing, as if the cat had merely walked across the floor instead of me coming in the home. So that, that was my mother. That is uh, the way she conducted herself all my life. But she said this, and this encompasses, I think, <clears throat> my mother's personality. <clears throat> Nothing you could do would entitle you to praise. <clears throat> you ought to praise the Lord for giving you an opportunity to do it. And that, in one sentence, is Hannah Simpson Grant. That is my mother. That's the lady who reared me and shaped my life. The woman, the person I expect I am most like. But... Uh, Nothing can entitle you to praise. You, if anything occurs of good nature, praise the Lord for you having had the opportunity to do it. Well, after my father died in 1873, mother went to live with my sister, uh, Jenny, in uh, Virginia and then in Bergen County, New Jersey, where she died. And when mother died, it was sudden. She had woke up that morning, felt fine, read the paper, drank her coffee, visited with my sister. And then about 12.30, she began having chest pains. And within a couple of hours, she was gone. I said this to the Reverend John Newman, who officiated her funeral there in New Jersey. The hymn they sang was How Firm a Foundation. And I told the Reverend John Newman Make such disposition of the services as in your judgment seems appropriate. But in the remarks which you make, speak of her only as a pure-minded, simple-hearted, earnest Methodist Christian. Make no reference to me. She gained nothing by any position I have filled or honors that may have been paid me. I owe all this and all that I am to her honest, earnest, modest, and sincere piety. I wanted no mention. I didn't want my name to overshadow my mother. Mother's only wish 
at the time of her death regarding her death was that she would be buried beside her husband, Jesse. And she was interred in Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati, Ohio, next to her husband, my father, Jesse Grant. I had a good relationship with my mother. I always craved her affection and her attention, which she was not forthcoming for me or any of my siblings. Mother was a good person. It's been said to me that if the Methodist Church had saints, Hannah Grant would be the first one. She was a, a, a good woman, a fine Christian woman who profoundly believed in God and the Bible. But she didn't show affection to anybody in the family. It just wasn't her way. So that's all I should say, I think, at this time in reflecting upon my parents. I think I've given you a, a good uh, view, uh, hopefully some insight into who and what my parents were. And it's been good to reflect with you about my parents. I, I love them dearly. But for the moment, I have said quite enough and I must be about my business. I'm glad that you saw fit to join me and hope that you will see fit to join me again when we come to the library or wherever we may be and I reflect on my presidency or people, places, or events in my life after my presidency. So I'm President Ulysses S. Grant bidding you a fond adieu.